we know there are 150 Met officers alone under investigation for sexual uh, allegations or yeah. racism. This is way, way too many. Um, and the Met needs to start turning those stones over with more speed and diligence. And I welcome that. He won't be eligible for parole until at least 30 years have passed, by which time he will be a very old man. But worth reflecting that this was 17 years of offending, numerous offences, 85 offences in total that we know about. And um, it, it is a relief that it is such a severe sentence, but it really does strike fear into one's heart that somebody like that could have been a serving police officer for so long. It, it was open, Caroline, wasn't it, to the... Uh... Uh, to the judge to impose a whole life sentence, but it wasn't recommended by the prosecution and the judge chose not to do that. Is that in any way surprising to you? Well, look, um, and grievous though his crimes are, he didn't kill anyone, thank goodness, because from what I understand from some of the reporting, it could have very easily, the, the violence uh, and the sexual violence could very easily have led to someone's uh, tragic death. And so, look... I, I leave it in the hands of the judge to make the right decision and I'm not going to criticise her in any way. I think uh, both her um, and the, the prosecution will have had to sit through a phenomenal amount of really disturbing evidence and so yes. I thank them for doing their job uh, yeah. properly. And he won't be out until he is at least 78 yes. years old. Yes, yes. Now, look, so the, uh, the, uh, the examination of what happened here, what went wrong, what can be learned of it, that goes on. And the, the Angelini inquiry, which was set up over the after the murder of Sarah Everard, that is to be widened to include any lessons from the Carrick case. So given that that's going to happen, Caroline, what do you think ought to be taken aboard by the inquiry, uh, looking for ways uh, to, well, to produce a better future? Vetting processes, I think they uh, first and foremost have to be looked at and uh, re-vetting. I think that's absolutely crucial that we cannot assume because a uh, an officer has passed vetting at the start of their career, has passed vetting when they're given uh, a job with firearms. Um, there needs to be a mechanism that allows, as Sir Mark Rowley put it, the, the dots to be joined up. And it's absolutely inconceivable that this uh, hasn't happened in the past, that the Met hasn't had proper mechanisms in place. And whether that's better whistleblowing, whether that's better reporting, better collection of data, and it needs to be data across forces. Yeah. We can't say that this is just a Met problem. We know that there were concerns raised, I think, previously in both Hampshire and Hertfordshire. Um, and so it has to be about making sure that police services work together and that the police as a whole has a robust mechanism to make sure that individuals like this don't keep getting away with it, cannot be allowed to believe, as he put it, that he was the law. No, he wasn't. He was a criminal. Right. You put it very strongly, Caroline. So, so given that, is it a surprise to you that there is no mandatory uniform vetting process in use across police forces? Absolutely. It should be mandatory. It should be the same. It should be incredibly robust and rigorous. And that's what we have to see. The Met and other police services make sure they put in place. And they have to do it quickly. It is... Um, now several years since the horrendous, tragic murder of Sarah Everard, we have this case. Sir Mark Rowley has warned us that we can expect to see more as the Met starts turning over stones. We know there are 150 Met officers alone under investigation for sexual uh, allegations or yeah. racism. This is way, way too many. Um, and the Met needs to start turning those stones over with more speed and diligence. So is it right then do you think, for the uh, the Angelini inquiry, for the, the Inspectorate of Constabulary inquiry, which is going on, as it were, in parallel, for those things to, to churn through their course before we, we get to anything like a, a, a clear system of regulation, maybe backed up by law? Should there be legislation? Could the government take the initiative in this, perhaps? Well, look, I think that's a matter for the Home Secretary to decide whether the government needs to step in. I think, actually, the, the Met could start putting in place stepping stones to better vetting processes, better whistleblowing processes uh, right now. Um, I'm not sure that they need the investigation to be concluded before they can recognise their own failings and start working out what they could do to make systems more effective. It's imperative that lessons are learned, but at the same time, they could be looking at their processes and working out how they can make them better 
now, not waiting. I wonder, we're looking ultimately at the, the, the question of trust or failing trust in our police police service. What, what are your impressions on that as a, as a member of parliament, as a, as a, as a, as a citizen, as a, as a woman? What are you picking up about the, the degree of a problem that we're living with now of collapsing trust in the police? How, how serious do you think it really is? Well, look, my message to women across London and indeed women across the country is that we have to have faith in our police service and that we should, our first instinct should always be to trust the police officer and that individuals like Carrick are, um, thank goodness, they are not the norm. But equally, women need to feel confident to come forward and report. And I think that's the strongest message is that we need women to feel empowered, that their concerns will be taken seriously, that crimes will be investigated, that they will be believed. And that's the message that came out very clearly from the Carrick case is that he had intimidated his victims into believing that nobody would take their word over his. Now, look, that is the classic tactic of an abuser. You won't be believed. No one will believe you over me. I'm a powerful police officer. So, look, we have to make sure that victims are given the support they need. And today, we need to think first and foremost of those victims who are brave enough to come forward and use them as a shining example of the women who have been empowered to speak up, who have been believed by the courts and who have seen a significant sentence passed on a hideous offender.